Okay, guys, here we go. So we're, we're starting off with the neurology for Met, Met 1. Uh, like I said before, this is incredibly nuanced material. Um, I've spent a significant part of the weekend uh, prepping for this. Uh, mainly cutting stuff out and distilling things down and trying to come up with the best way of presenting the most important topics and hopefully hopefully we'll, we'll see that come to fruition today. So just a quick question before we get started. Yeah. This afternoon are we doing lab? Or yes. Are we also, okay. Yeah, we're doing lab this afternoon. Yeah. yeah definitely. We'll, uh, we'll start off on some neuro assessment. Uh, we'll be talking about cranial nerves. Uh, assessing the cranial nerves, which you guys probably did in advanced assessment, right? Uh, in your intro to advanced care, was that Ed or Art? Or it was Art, 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 yeah. Arthur. Yeah. So we'll redux. We'll redux some of that material, uh, and then there will be some small group scenarios that you guys will go through. And then starting tomorrow, we'll talk about the oral station today. And then starting tomorrow, you guys will actually have your first oral um, station that you'll do in the afternoon. Um, it's not a whole lot of fun, but it's not. yeah, it is. Doctor Devon or with you? Uh, no, uh, it'll be with I believe Cheryl's going to come and do it, and then I'll be doing more group scenarios um, with you guys as well, because that's really where you integrate a lot of your knowledge is in, in the group scenarios. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about neurology. So neurology is the study of the nervous system, and what's the job of the nervous system? Just in general. Yeah, to tell the body to do things. Okay. Um, voluntarily or involuntarily. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a command center, right? It's kind of the, the command center. It's uh, what in essence controls all the major uh, functions of our body. And it's yeah, and it's also where <clears throat> yeah, where what we say higher functions come from. Okay. Um, and um, those higher functions come from certain areas, and those lower functions or those more um, animal or more survival functions come from certain areas. But in general, the nervous system really comes down to the brain, the spinal cord, and then all of the neurons or nerves that come off of the brain and spinal cord. And so we differentiate the nervous system into two major sections or two major flavors if you will. You have what's called the central nervous system which consists of the brain and spinal cord and then we have what's known as the peripheral nervous system which is everything that comes out of the spinal column with the exception of the cranial nerves which are nerves that come directly out of the brain and go to where they need to go. Um, so the cranial nerves come out of the, directly off the brain and go to where they need to go, whereas the spinal nerves are all of the other nerves that leave the central nervous system. Are you guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. So there are two major ways to get out of the CNS, and that is either through a cranial nerve or through a spinal nerve. And then when we talk endocrinology, there's an indirect way, um, and it's sort of a direct way, but we'll get to that when we get there. All right. So what I want to do real quick is I want to talk about the, the topographical anatomy, which you guys should be very familiar with. So when we talk about the, uh, the central nervous system, okay, the brain okay, is what, about a pound, one, two pounds, gelatinous kind of substance. Yeah, basically two fists together, okay. You know, a couple pounds, a less, little less than a kilogram. Um, and that's where it's all happening, right? Um, about 100 billion what we call neurons, and the neuron is the functional unit of the central nervous system. Okay, it's the uh, functional cell. Now, as we will talk about here in a little bit, um, there are many other different cell types, and we'll talk about some of them, but um, traditionally we say that the neuron is the functional cell, and then you have all these other cells which support and assist the neurons in doing what they need to do. You guys okay with that? Yeah. So we have about 100 billion of them in our brain, and from those <laughs> neurons, from pretty simple processes that occur with those neurons, those neurons are very similar to cardiac tissue, right? They have the same 
fundamental properties as cardiac tissue. Conductivity, right? Mm -hmm. um, a type of automaticity, some of them at least, okay? They can depolarize, um, they can conduct, they can depolarize, they can hold membrane potentials. So in many, many ways, they are very similar to cardiac cells, although they don't contract, obviously. <clears throat> now, um, the brain is so important that um, a product of ev evolution has been what? A way of protecting the brain, right? A way of protecting the central nervous system. So the two major ways that we protect the, neuro the central nervous system are with the cranium, right? So I have bone, I have a cranial vault that surrounds the brain. And then I have a bony vault that surrounds the spinal cord as well, right? I have the spinal column. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's the, that's the hardened shell. And then the brain and spinal cord also is surrounded by several layers of connective tissue that is protective. And we call that connective tissue what? The meninges. The meninges, right? The meninges. So you have two different types of protective tissues. You've got your bony tissues and you've got your meninges. Um, remember, the spinal cord is also covered in meninges, just like the brain. You guys okay with that? So let's just acquaint ourselves with um, the external anatomy, if you will, or cranial anatomy. The cranium, uh, the cranial vault has several bones. Okay, so let's just review those bones. So what's this bone up here? This is the frontal, right? This is the frontal bone here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, and what is this right here? What part? Okay. And what's another name for anterior? Because it's terminology that's used in neurology quite a bit. It's a, other, it's a synonym for anterior. This is ventral. Ventral. Ventral and then dorsal. That terminology tends to be commonly used in neurology, okay? So ventral is anterior, dorsal is posterior. I just think of dorsal thin, right? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we've got the frontal bone. What is the bone back here? Occipital. The occipital bone, and this is the occiput. Okay, good. What bone do I have right here? Temporal. The temporal. The temporal is a little lower, right? Mm -hmm. And then what bone do I have here? Parietal. I have the parietal bone. Okay, and that makes up the major bones of the cranium, right? The frontal, the occipital. Okay, I have the temporal and the parietal. You also have facial bones that protect, okay? The face also protects the central nervous system. What is this bone right here? The uh, zygoma, right? The zygoma and the zygomatic arch. What's this bone right here? Um, yeah, it's the orbital bone, right? Okay. What about right here? Maxilla. Maxilla. And what is this bone right here? Right. So I've got the mandible, the maxilla, okay, the zygoma, the orbit, right? And then I have the various nasal bones. All right. You guys okay with that? Pretty simple stuff. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, now the spinal column. Spinal column is divided into how many um, general areas are there? Four general areas. You have what's this area here? Cervical. Cervical. What's this area here? Thoracic. Thoracic. Lumbar. Lumbar. And uh, your cosseal, right? A lot of people will combine the sacral and cosseal mm -hmm. um, because they're basically all fused vertebrae, as you can see. So, how many vertebrae do I have in the cervical? I have seven. C1 down to C7. Mm -hmm. How many thoracic vertebrae do I have? Twelve. Twelve. How many lumbar? Five. Five. And How many sacral? Five. And then costeal. Seven, twelve, five, five, four. Just think of that. Seven, twelve, five, five, four. Is that about 33? More or less. You guys okay with that? Yeah. Cool with that? Okay. Good. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. Okay. You guys good with that? So yes. far, so good, right? Nothing, yeah. nothing crazy going on. It's easy. It's easy. Yeah. All right. So, so now what we're going to do is we're going to open the cranial vault, and we're going to look at that magical goo inside that makes us who we are. Which is it is amazing to me. It, it, it truly is amazing that from about a hundred billion neurons, 
Um, a human being emerges, a consciousness emerges from all of the processes um, that you can actually quantify to some extent what's going on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, when I open this up, okay, and I take a slice down through the midline like that, and then you look like that, what section are we looking at? What kind of thing? Sagittal, right? This is a sagittal, right? Sagittal. Now what I'm going to do instead of going straight to a sagittal is I'm going to just pull. I, I want you guys to imagine, and I wish I had a better model, but imagine that I just cut the top of the cranium off and then I just pull the whole brain out of the cranium intact. Okay, I don't cut it or take any sections or anything. And I, yeah, I'm just holding the whole brain Obviously, I have to cut, cut the spinal column, the spinal cord rather, to pull the brain out. And I'm holding the brain. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the brain. All right. So the brain is kind of interesting because it has basically a large top part, right? And that large top part kind of sits on a smaller part or the bottom part. You know, kind of a top, middle, and bottom, if you will. Okay. The largest part that we see is the top part. And it is kind of wrinkled and folded, right? Mm -hmm. And what is that larger top part called? That's called the cerebrum. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now the cerebrum is divided into two hemispheres. Are you guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's divided. So imagine that I'm holding the brain, and what I've done is I've just turned it a little bit. Okay, I've turned, it's just slanted a little bit so you can see both hemispheres. Mm -hmm. So I have, what's this right here? This would be called the, right. 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 this is the right hemisphere. Yes. All right, good. And then this is, left. this is the left hemisphere. All right, you guys cool with that? Uh -huh. So I've got the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere. Okay. And what I'm going to do is, and then I have a line here. What is this line that separates uh, the hemispheres? It is a fissure. Yeah, what is it called? Huh? No. The longitudinal fissure? Is that, that is that called the longitudinal fissure? I don't according to the book. What's that? According to the book, yeah. You're right. Okay, this is a longitudinal fissure, okay? That separates the right and left hemisphere. I'm not gonna do anything yet, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna tilt the brain up, and so we're just gonna look at one hemisphere. Right. But the way the brain works is it pretty much is symmetrical. So what you see on one side, one hemisphere, you more or less are going to see on the other side. The same structures, if you will. Mm -hmm. There is remarkable symmetry. Does that make sense? Yes. Now what we're going to do is we're going to divide the cerebrum up into some different um, lobes, if you will. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start back here. And what is this lobe here on the back? This is called the occipital lobe. All right. Good. What is this lobe right here called? This is the parietal lobe. That's right up in here. Good. And these more or less correspond with the cranial bones that cover that area. Okay, what about over here? So this would be down. This is the temporal lobe. And then what about this large area? Okay, this is the frontal lobe. Good. Now, we can also see some other structures. Okay, these are the, these are the lobes of the cerebrum. Okay, but there are also some other structures that we can see. We can see some structures that the cerebrum kind of sits on top of. Mm -hmm. um, and what is this little thing this here? Cerebellum? This is a cerebellum. It kind of looks like a little brain that, that sticks off the bottom there. Okay, this is a cerebellum, good. Okay, what's this right here? This is the brain stem, right? But it has different parts as well. So what is the superior most part of the brain stem right there? In the oh, that's the it, it actually, the pons actually is inferior to this structure that I'm talking about here. 
What's that? Midbrain. The midbrain? Okay, you got the midbrain. And then the pons, right? Then you have medulla. The pons, and then the medulla. Medulla. And we've already talked about the pons and medulla to some extent, right? Yes. Because we say that we say that our major cardiac and respiratory centers are located in the pons and medulla. In addition, your vomiting centers are also located there. And we'll talk about vomiting in more detail in, in gastroenterology. We'll actually talk about the neurological basis of it because it will help us understand how certain drugs, certain anti-emetic drugs work. Um, for example, when you give somebody an antihistamine like diphenhydramine, right, mm -hmm. it helps with vomiting. Why? Because histamine is not only a pro-inflammatory molecule, but histamine is a neurotransmitter inside of the brain, right? um, and other things. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, you guys good with that? Yeah. Now we also know we also know um, that. Uh, certain areas of the brain are responsible for certain activities, mm -hmm. certain functions, if you will. So let's start with the frontal lobe. What is the job of the frontal lobe? What primarily goes on there? Mm -hmm. Good, so these are your highest, this is your highest order cognitive processes, right? So higher thinking, cognition, Okay, planning, okay, personality, okay. So these are really high order processes that are coming from here. Okay, what about the occipital lobe? What's going on back there? This is primarily visual processing. Good Lord, guys, your computers are just getting crazy. This is just me. <laughs> well, no, because somebody, I was hearing uh, Skype and all kinds of stuff. Being, that was also that was oh. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. There's a volume button. button. There's, There's a music yeah, coming just up every button. single time. Just a few buttons. <laughs> okay, good. What about the parietal lobe? What's going on primarily here in the parietal lobe? <clears throat> Word recognition? Sensory, some motor functions. Primarily, it, to make it simple, primarily sensory. We can say primarily sensory and a little bit of motor as well, but yes. we'll kind of just say primarily sensory. sensory processing, okay? How about the temporal lobe here? What's the big thing that goes on in here? Memory. Uh, it is involved in memory. What else? Vision. Uh, not so much vision. Or not primarily, what we'll say. What's that? Understanding. Um, yes, yes, some cognition. What about hearing? Yes, there you go. Right? Yeah, your auditory nerve comes in, right? Hearing. <laughs> Memory, hearing. Okay. All right. Now, what I want to do is um, the cerebrum is further subdivided. The cerebrum is further subdivided into um, some layers, okay? So if you were to look at the cerebrum, okay, it kind of has this outer layer called the cerebral, the cerebral cortex, right, is the outer layer. So the cerebral, and the cerebral cortex, when we look at it, what general color does it kind of take on? Kind of takes on a gray color, and we call that what? Gray matter. What primarily is gray matter? Why is it gray? Yeah, it contains cell bodies. That's where the bodies of the little neurons and the supports of the glial cells, which we'll get to here in just a little bit, Okay, that's gray matter. You guys good with that? Mm -hmm. And then underneath the cortex, you have this, this white matter. So you kind of have this gray matter <coughs> here. And then you have the white matter underneath that. And the white matter consists primarily of what? What makes it white? Not the bodies, but the... There you go. You're on the right track. We haven't talked about them yet, but the axons of the neurons. 
And the axons are covered in a fatty insulating substance, which we'll talk about. And yeah, it is that fatty insulating substance that gives them that white color. You got a lot of fat in your brain, right? So whenever you see white matter, you are looking at the axons of neurons. So the white matter is kind of like the highways or the roads. And then the gray matter is kind of like the buildings where all the, all the processing is actually going on. And then the information is being sent to and from those processing areas through the little roads, through the, the white matter. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. You also have white and gray matter in the spinal cord as well, which we'll talk about. You guys cool with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I know it's basic so far, but we, we start basic and we work our way up from there. Okay. Now, the, um, when we look at the cerebral cortex, it has these little folds, okay? It has these little folds that kind of fold in just a little bit, and then it has these deep grooves. So what are the little folds called? They're just little folds. They increase the surface area a little bit. Okay, you have these folds, and then you have these really deep fissures that actually are, these fissures are actually what separate the uh, different, the major structures, the different lobes. So what's the difference between just a little fold and a fissure, a deep fissure? Okay, you Google scholars. Type in brain fissures versus folds. Because they're actually proper terms that you, you'll want to be familiar with. Sulci and gyri. Sulcus is singular and gyrus is singular. But what is a sulcus and what is a gyrus? Sulcus is the inversion. Yeah, the sulcus a deep thing or? The deep. It's the deep. Okay. No? Yeah, it's, it's real easy to get these mixed up. Sulcus is the deep part in gyrus. There you go. So the, gy the gyrus is the kind of the little hilly part, right? G the, the gyri, or the gyrus, these are the hilly little bumps that when you look at the brain, you see these, these, these hilly little bumps, okay? That's the sulcus, the, sul the gyrus, excuse me, or the gyri. And then the sulcus are the really deep, Fissures, okay, so the gyrus, all right, oops, there, better? Yes. All right, so, and gyri is plural, plural sulci, plural, you guys cool with that? Yeah. Okay, and so the, the, the gyri are what kind of allow for more surface area, and then, like I said, the deep sulci are kind of what um, divide the general sections of the brain up. And so whenever you see a, a, big, a major sulcus, you're seeing kind of a, a dividing area between, okay, this is one area of the brain and this is another area. And there is a, a sure bet, it's a sure bet that, 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 that the the two areas are probably doing different things, or probably processing or controlling different areas of the body. Are you guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, good deal. Now, let's talk about that connective tissue that protects the brain, okay? So here on top of the, the uh, cerebral cortex, I have drawn uh, some structures for you guys. So this outermost hardened structure here is the skull, all right? All right, and then what is the tough, thick layer underneath the skull? This is the dura mater. All right, and then what's underneath the dura mater? The arachnoid membrane. And then what is the thin, paper thin, yeah, pia, the pia mater. And I just think of it as the meninges form a pad of protection around the brain, starting at the pia matter. The pia matter surrounds the brain itself, and then the arachnoid matter, and then the dura matter. 
You guys okay with that? And it's as important because we can get hemorrhaging in between the, these different layers, right? Yeah. And where the hemorrhage is and what type of hemorrhage it is generally causes different or characteristic signs and symptoms. There are some differences between, say, how a subdural hematoma or subdural bleed and how a subarachnoid bleed, okay, which are the two major ones, or an epidural bleed, okay, how those uh, different uh, bleeds present. <clears throat> so when I say epidural, where is the epidural space? It's between the, it's the top most. Epi means on top of, right? Yeah, so so the epidural, there you go, between the skull and the dura, okay? Where is subdural, the subdural space? Dura and the arachnoid membrane, okay, good. And then the subarachnoid? And the arachnoid and the pia mater, okay? Now these spaces are not in the brain itself, right? It's not in the parenchyma of the brain, but they still, uh, when you get bleeding in those spaces, can certainly affect the brain. Now, between certain layers of the meninges, there is a kind of insulating fluid that circulates. What is that fluid called? The cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. Where is most of the CSF in the meninges? There you go. Okay, good. All right. So in the arachnoid, <coughs> subarachnoid space, yeah. right? You guys good with that? Yes. So in the subarachnoid space is where, and I'll just draw an arrow to that. Subarachnoid? Yeah. 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 Where your CSF, your cerebral <coughs> spinal fluid, and I'll just draw a, 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 an arrow to that, that space. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Good to go? <coughs> um, do we see this with the spinal cord as well? or? Yes. Yes. Because the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, okay? You guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. So far so good? Okay. Um, what about the cerebellum? What is the, the general job of the cerebellum? Um, it's like on your unconscious. Like Somatic control? control? It is involved, not, not consciousness. It, not it's unconscious. No, not unconscious. No. It's actually, yeah, say it again. Say it again, Christy. Uh, what do we mean by that, though? Somatic motor information? So, um, what we're aware Stuff. of. Communicates with other parts of your CNS? Or sensory information? Okay, you, you're on the right track. Awareness. Motor so, responses. Yeah, this, the cerebellum, what does soma mean, anyway? Like. <coughs> what is a literal meaning of soma? Soma literally means body. Yeah, soma means body. So it's talking about so, so, somatic motor is body movement, but the cerebellum, the, the big job of the cerebellum is what we call fine motor coordination, yes. right? Um, and um, you guys have all poisoned your cerebellum at one point or another. Okay. Yes, right? And what okay. happens when your cerebellum gets poisoned with ethanol? You what happens to your fine, yeah. And what happens to the gait? Have you seen a drunk walk? Yeah. And, and they call that ataxia, right? Mm -hmm. That staggering kind of gait. That's called ataxic gait. We see that kind of gait in people that have damage to their cerebellum, and there is a disease process that results in damage to certain parts of the cerebellum. Hmm? Cerebral palsy? Not cerebral palsy. Um, it's a chronic disease. Parkinson's, Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's. And, and you see, they lack the fine, right? When, when, I, when I try to do something fine motor-wise, I can pick that up, but what happens when I have Parkinson's is I have this shaky, disjointed movement. I don't have that fine coordination. And you see these people with Parkinson's, they get this real wide gait, and they kind of shuffle around, they have this ataxic gait. That's what, this, so the cerebellum is kind of like a fine tuning. Like all the gross motor stuff comes from other areas of their brain, but then the cerebellum kind of takes this gross movement and smooths it out and gives you that real fine fine tuning, if you will. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a cerebellum. So we've talked about the major structures. Now what I'm gonna do is, 
okay? So I've got my guy here, my gal, right? Got my guy, my gal. Right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, it's gonna be all horror movie, right? I'm gonna, it's, it's Halloween, right? It's, it's almost October. I'm gonna take my, my knife and I'm gonna go wham, like that, right? The big old machete. Big old machete, I'm gonna go whoosh, like this, right down the midline. And then the head, you know, like some video game is gonna go whoosh, like that, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? <laughs> and I'm going to look at a view that looks like this. And this is known as a sagittal, right? And it's sagittal view. You'll immediately notice some really, and, and I, you know what? I'll just pass this around. You guys can take a look at it. Um, and you'll immediately notice something very interesting. The hemispheres of the brain, the right and left hemisphere, even though there's a real large sulcus there, they're connected. And there's a real thick band of white matter there, isn't there? And that thick band of white matter that allows the two hemispheres to communicate with one another, okay, is known as the what? Corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, right? The corpus callosum. The corpus or colossum, as some people will say. So you have the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is what allows the right and left hemisphere to communicate with each other pretty much effortlessly, right? Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you a question. If I if I went ahead and cut through the, the corpus callosum, <clears throat> would that be devastating to the patient? No. Would it be devastating? Would it be a devastating thing to do? Assuming I didn't damage the hemispheres themselves. You could still function. But the right and left hemispheres would not be able to communicate with each other very well, would they? And believe it or not, there is a type of surgery that is done occasionally to people where you actually, where we will go in, not me, but when I say we in healthcare, we'll go in and sever the corpus callosum. Why would you ever want to do that to a human being? Just to take out half of the brain? Mm, well, yeah, yeah, you will sever the corpus callosum if you're taking out a hemisphere, like a hemispherectomy, which occasionally is done. Um, that's, a dev that's pretty devastating, though. Um, it, it, kids, though, when you do it in a kid, uh, there's a concept known as plasticity. Have you ever heard of that term, Pla neuroplasticity? And that is the ability for the brain to be kind of plastic and malleable and, and to uh, for the brain to kind of adapt to damage and changes, um, you're not plastic as an adult. You're just not. <laughs> but as a little kid, um, before you have cemented most of your brain development, there's a lot of plasticity. So taking out a hemisphere is still going to cause lifelong deficits, but it's not as devastating as a little kid. But let's assume that we don't take out a hemisphere. Let's assume that. All I'm doing is cutting the corpus callosum. Is that devastating necessarily? No. no, but it causes some really queer things to occur because the hemispheres are not able to communicate with each other. But why would we do that? Why would we cut the corpus callosum? What, what good Can would you do something else? Maybe one of the hemispheres is like not functioning. You're on the right track. Seizures. Might be. Seizures. Why? Why would do? Why would cutting the corpus callosum? There you go. Because some patients, what happens is a seizure activity starts in one hemisphere, right? And then that seizure activity can move over to the other hemisphere and cause generalized seizures. And if we're not able to control seizures, something you might be able to do is to cut the corpus callosum. So at least you're isolating that seizure, right? It's yeah. not causing a generalized seizure, you're isolating it to one hemisphere. So that is a, um, a very aggressive way of treating um, severe intractable seizures. Um, there are some really cool videos on patients that have had what they call split brain surgery or a um, dissection of the corpus callosum, really in, where people are like drawing independently with both hands. Um, they're, they've actually, that what they'll do is they'll actually like put um, like a projector in, in front of with two, uh, two, uh, two video screens. And there was one they were like showing, I forget what side, they're showing one side religious imagery. And the patient was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a Christian or whatever, I, I feel really religious. 
And then they showed those same images on the other side, and they're like, I, uh, I don't believe in any of that stuff. That's silliness. And yeah, uh, and so you really had this, this, this compartmentalization of, of, of really important things. Now, luckily, because normally, how do people, normally when I see, I see with both eyes. Mm -hmm. And so that information, that, that, that visual information can, even though my corpus callosum's cut, that visual information can still kind of slosh its way around the brain. So in day-to-day -day life, we don't see these, these major issues with these people. It's only when we, we put separate cameras and we start separating the visual input and, and we, we say only certain type of input in one area, only certain types of input in another area, and then you get these really queer things that, that arise um, with, with personality and cognition, et cetera. Um, and there, there are many, many other things. But anyway, but it is important and it is the major way that the right and left hemispheres are able to communicate with each other. Now there are some other structures that I want you guys to be aware of. So right under the corpus callosum, kind of more toward the front here, you have kind of this large structure. <coughs> okay, what is this structure right here called? Diencephalon. Um, it is part of the diencephalon. Diencephalon is like several different structures. This is known as the thalamus. And then what's under the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. And then this little um, sac-like structure underneath the hypothalamus is known as the, it's actually a part of the endocrine system. The hypothalamus is too, but. It's a little sac like, has two, two lobes to it. It's called the, it starts with a P, the pituitary, pituitary gland. Okay. What's the role of the thalamus, guys? What's the role of the thalamus? What does the thalamus do? Uh, receives incoming sensory messages and relays them to the So the thalamus is like a relay station. Information that's coming in and out of the brainstem kind of goes through the thalamus, and the thalamus is in a sense like the post office. Okay, you need to go here, you need to go here, you need to go here. Oh, oh, come here. Okay, you need to go down here. So it acts as kind of a relay station. Okay, what's the role of the hypothalamus? The hypothalamus. Yes, hypothalamus, if, if you were to distill what the hypothalamus does to one word, it's homeostasis, okay? So auto, major autonomic functions are automatic, right? That's what autonomic means, automatic functions are there. One that's really important for us is the thermoregulatory center. Mm -hmm. This is the thermostat of the brain, the hypothalamus. You guys okay with that? What's, what about the pituitary? What does it do? What's the major thing? Say, you, you, there you go. It secretes hormones. It's all you have to know at this point, because we are going to study this thing in, in, in agonizing detail in a little bit. Not today. And then I just drew this little structure here just to kind of show you where it is. And this is what's called the optic uh, uh, chasm or chiasm. And that's part of the optic nerve, okay, right there at the what we call the base of the brain. You guys cool with that? <coughs> Is, it, is that okay? That, that kind of makes sense? The major structures there? Okay. Um, and then this, of course, is just a cut, a slice through the cerebellum. Um, I've got the uh, the pons, the medulla, the spinal cord. You guys cool with that? Yeah. So far, so good. Um, I know I'm leaving a lot of things out because I have to. Um, there are some other notable um, structures in the brain, um, you also have what are called ventricles in the brain. And what are ventricles? And again, I, it's just really too difficult for me to really draw them. You do have pictures of them in your book, though. Like sections within sections. Well, they're the hollowed areas, right? They're hollow areas within the brain. Well, they're not actually hollow. There's five of them. There are five of them, right? And what, 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 what's, what about the ventricles? What's going on with those ventricles? They're filled with CSF, right? So the brain, not only is it surrounded by CSF, 
but these ventricles that sit in the middle of the brain are filled with CSF. So it's kind of a double CSF system, and we actually see this as a spinal cord as well. There's a little canal in the very center of the spinal cord full of CSF, mm -hmm. and then CSF surrounds it as well. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so you have these ventricles. They're full of CSF, <coughs> um, there are five of them. You're not gonna have to memorize all five of them, um, but you just have to know them. There are, what are the two largest ventricles though? <coughs> Third and fourth. Isn't there a picture in the book that, that talks about the ventricles? No? Maybe? No? A little bit. Well, all you Google scholars, look up ventricles in the brain. The picture's dried up pretty quick. Yeah, the picture's dried up pretty quick. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. And the lateral ventricles, if I were to take the brain and instead of a sagittal view, I were to, <coughs> instead of cutting this way, all right, I were to take my machete and cut this way, okay, that would be a what? A, so instead of, instead of cutting this way, okay, I cut this way. That is called a coronal view. Okay, a coronal view. Corona means crown, right? And this is the view. Why this is important is this is what view you see the brain in when you look at a CAT scan of the brain. A CAT scan takes coronal slices. Okay? And when you look at a CAT scan, the major ventricles that you see in the brain, okay, the coronal slices, it looks something kind of like, kind of like this, okay, and taking a coronal slice, so this is anterior, this is posterior, okay, you will actually see something that looks like this. And those things in the middle of the brain are the ventricles. Okay. And then you have the right left hemisphere, and you've got the corpus callosum, and you've got that central sulcus there that um, delineates the right left hemisphere. Okay, So it's not a sagittal view that we're looking at. It's actually a coronal view. OK, you guys good so far? Mm -hmm. doing, doing OK? Make sense, more or less? OK, cool. So before we move on, I just want to talk about some of the different types of cells that we have in the brain, or in the, in the central nervous system. Okay. So there are two major types of cells in the CNS. We have the functional unit, which is known as what? What's the functional unit? The functional cell of the central nervous system. The, the neuron, right? So I have neurons. All right, those are the functional units. So those are, those are the ones that, that uh, maintain uh, membrane potential. Those are the ones that can depolarize. Those are the ones that can send action potentials. Those are the ones that release neurotransmitters, etc. You have neurons and you have all of the other cells that support the neurons, okay? And those are known as glial cells. Glial cells, all right, glial. And believe it or not, there are more glial cells than there are neurons in your brain. Many more glial cells than there are neurons. You guys okay so far? Mm -hmm. Now there are several types of glial cells that we need to be familiar with, okay? The two major types of glial cells can fall into are, are two categories, if you will. You have what are called microglia, microglia, and macroglia. You guys cool with that so far? Mm -hmm. Now the microglial cells, the microglial cells are primarily immune. Okay, they're primarily immune cells 
and they are primarily responsible for repairing damage to the best of their ability and removing debris after damage, infection, inflammation has occurred, okay? That's a major function of the microglia, the microglial cells, you guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. Now, the macroglia, we have several subtypes of macroglial cells, okay? And I'll talk about the major ones. So the first major uh, subtype of macroglial cells are star. They look kind of like stars, and so we call those astrocytes. <coughs> Astrocytes. And does anyone know what astrocytes do? What's their primary, primary function? They form a very important protective covering. No. Nope. Meninges are outside of the brain, right? These are inside of the brain. This is nervous tissue. These form what is known as the blood brain barrier. barrier. All right. In the brain, okay, is very different from other parts of the body. In the brain, there is a layer, another layer of tissue that separates the neurons from their blood supply. Okay. What's that? From the just capillaries. Yeah, from the capillaries, from the capillary beds. And that is known as a blood-brain barrier. So that allows the brain to be very selective about what gets in and what gets out. Are you guys cool with that? And in general, polar molecules, this is important, polar molecules cannot get into the brain because polar molecules cannot get through lipid membranes very well, which forms right, a lipid bilayer, okay? So when I give somebody a drug that is very polar, okay, it does not get into the brain very easily, right? This is why, and, and maybe you guys have asked this question, it, you know that there are some diseases where you have low levels of dopamine, right? Like Parkinson's disease, depression, where you get low levels of dopamine. And I thought this for years. I always thought, well, why the hell don't we just give people dopamine, right? We give it IV all the, all the damn time. Or have you ever seen somebody get a dopamine infusion and go, damn, I feel good. I know I'm dying, I know I'm hypotensive, but my I'm totally not having any existential angst about having a low blood pressure anymore. Anyone ever see that sudden change in somebody's attitude or personality when getting a dopamine drip? Even though we know that dopamine is a very important neurotransmitter involved in pleasure and reward pathways in the brain. What's going on? Well, what's going on is dopamine cannot pass through the blood-brain barrier. So you give somebody dopamine in the IV, it can't get into the brain, right? It can't get into the brain. And there are lots of drugs like that that just can't get into the brain. So to get drugs into the brain, we have to have very non-polar drugs or very what we call lipophilic, lipid-loving drugs, drugs that dissolve in lipids very easily, okay? For example, there is a highly lipid-soluble drug and it killed somebody very famous not too long ago. Uh, Michael, Michael Jackson, right? Propofol. Propofol. <laughs> propofol is a lipid infusion. You give that propofol and it, it has no problem making its way through the blood-brain barrier. Boom, right on through there into the brain. And it acts, and it acts very quickly. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. um, nar opiates, or opioid, opiate, opioids, we'll, we'll keep it general. Another story. Morphine, you guys are all familiar with morphine, right? Morphine is a relatively polar drug. So when I give somebody morphine IV, uh, a substantial part of that morphine that you give your patient 
doesn't actually make it into the brain, it doesn't actually make it into the spinal cord where its major mechanism of action is. A lot of it just doesn't make it to those receptors, to the opioid receptors. However, we can do some simple modifications to the morphine. We can add what are called acetyl groups. We can acetylate the morphine. We can add two acetyl groups, and we can create a molecule called diacetylmorphine. And diacetylmorphine is much more nonpolar than morphine. And so when you give somebody diacetylmorphine, it penetrates right into the brain. Boom, right into the brain. And then when it gets into the brain, there are enzymes in the brain that metabolize it back into morphine. And now you have pure morphine in the brain. And what is the vernacular term for diacetylmorphine? No. No. It's not morphine sulfate. No, morphine, morph, morphine sulfate is mor morphine, right? Yeah. Heroin. 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 Yeah. Heroin is just acetylated morphine. You inject that heroin, that heroin goes right into the brain, it passes right through the blood brain barrier, no problem at all because it's nonpolar. And then once it gets into the brain, there are enzymes in the brain that turn it into morphine. And now you have pure morphine in the brain. That's what makes heroin so potent. That's what gives it its properties. So this whole blood-brain barrier business, this whole uh, lipophilic, hydrophilic, uh, or, or hydrophobic, li li lipophobic, these concepts, these chemical concepts that we talked about in the past are really important when we talk about getting drugs in and out of the brain. You guys go with that? So those are the astrocytes, okay? Blood-brain barrier, um, they're obviously really important in damage control and repair and support and overall support of <coughs> functions. Okay, the um, next uh, type of macroglia that I want to talk about are something called oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes. And does anyone know what the role of an oligodendrocyte is? And these are only found in the central nervous system. Okay? They're only found in the CNS, the oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that produce the myelin sheath that binds the neurons. Okay, so it's the it's so the neurons themselves are not making myelin. It's another cell called an oligodendrocyte that kind of wraps itself around the neuron that actually makes that, that, um, um, that, that myelin. Are you guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. There is a different cell that makes myelin in the peripheral nervous system though. So in the CNS, it's the oligodendrocytes. In the peripheral nervous system, in the PNS, it is the Schwann cells. Yes, the Schwann cells produce the myelin sheets. So in neurons, in your arms, your legs, outside of your spinal column, okay, in those areas, you have Schwann cells, you do not have oligodendrocytes. You guys cool with that? And then there's one more type of macroglia that I wanna talk about. And this has kind of the weirdest name, and this is the ependymal cells. These are the ependymal cells. <clears throat> the ependymal or ependymal, I believe, might be another way of, of, of saying it. And these cells line the ventricles of the brain. So what do you suppose they do? They line the inside of your ventricles. What do you suppose the major function of the ependymal cells is going to be? What? Oh, so that's your surfactant? Well, you kind of. What's it? Oh. You don't have surfactant in your brain. I know, but it's like the same type of. Like what is that stuff called? Yeah, they, 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 they are the cells that produce cerebral spinal cord. That's what I meant. Yeah. They line the ventricles, and that's where your CSF comes from, the epidermal cells. Okay, so you've got 
your neurons, which are your functional units, and then you have your glial cells, which support the neurons. You have microglia, primarily immune, and then you have your macroglia, of which you've got astrocytes, which form the barrier, the blood brain <coughs> barrier that protects and isolates the rest of the neurons. You've got your oligodendrocytes, which make the myelin in the central nervous system, brain spinal cord, and then you have Schwann cells that make myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And then finally you have the ependymal cells which produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And we know that an overproduction of cerebral spinal fluid can cause problems, right? Mm -hmm. And it can cause pressure in that <coughs> elevate, and that is a condition known as when you have too much cerebral spinal fluid. Yeah, sometimes they have to actually put a shot. Hydrocephalus, right? Hydrocephalus. Yeah. Okay, guys, it's 10 o'clock. Take already? a Yeah, already. Uh, take a break. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes and we'll continue.